the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Growing up, my dad always told me to carry a couple dollars on you because you never know what you're going to need. Very dad thing to say. Something I could see myself saying. And so I always carry a bill with me. If you carry a 20, you spend it, right? So I carry a $100 bill. You don't spend a $100 bill unless you got a problem. And so here's my $100 bill. This is what I carry. Uh, what's this worth? What's this worth? Is it worth your Bible? Can I buy your Bible for this? No? Okay. Can I buy your purse? Just the purse? No? Man, y'all, this is not worth much, is it? Can I buy your pen? No? Well, that's, is that a special pen? Okay. Wow. Very special pen. This ain't worth much. Is, <laughs> this ain't worth much, is it? What determines value? What determines how much this is worth? Right? Why, why, why can't this buy that pen? Why, why can't this buy your, your, your Bible? Right. Can you buy that watch? Hundred dollars, yeah. <laughs> I know I'd find something. <laughs> Why is this worth a watch but not a pen? Right? That's, that's interesting. Worth is such an interesting construct. Why is gold worth more than silver? More rare. Nope. It's not based on rarity. Why is gold worth more than silver? They both last forever, right? Why is gold worth more than silver? Why are diamonds worth more than emeralds? Easy not, to work with. What's that? Easier to work with. Nope. That's not it. It's not rarity either. There are, there are just as many diamonds. Actually, white emeralds are rarer than diamonds, but diamonds are worth more. Why are diamonds worth more than emeralds? Why is gold worth more than silver? created the market. Yes, it did. Yes, that, that's, that's a sermon right there. Uh, <laughs> worth, why is a BMW worth more than a Chevy? My father-in-law is a mechanic, and so I've chatted with him about this, and I asked him, so you open up the, 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 the lid, what's that called? Hood, God, that's pathetic. You, you open up the hood of a, of a Chevy, you open up the hood of a Beamer, and you know what you see? Parts. Are the parts on a Beamer worth more? Are, are, are they better made? Nope, they're just imported, so they cost more. Uh, why are things worth more? Because we have agreed as a community that we think Beamers are worth more than Chevys, gold is worth more than silver, and your pen is worth more than this $100 bill. <laughs> Worth. Worth is a construct of community. People gather together and we decide that this piece of paper, it's actually cloth, but this piece of, this bill is worth a certain amount. And worth changes, doesn't it? We call that worth inflation. And we don't like it. We don't like it one bit. And we kind of grumble about that, but what, where it gets really interesting is when worth changes quickly. In 2008, we had a big worth change. It was uh, the housing market. We went through this time period where very quickly houses uh, changed their, their worth. And so a house that was worth $150,000 was now worth $120,000. And people got very weirded out by this. Worth changed. And it was like, well, where did the money go? If my house was worth $150,000 and now it's worth $120,000, where did the 30 grand go? Well, did it go anywhere? A community, a local housing market agreed, or they came to a new consensus around what things were worth, and now your house is worth $30,000 less. We don't like to think of as worth as changing. But it does. Whenever the community changes its mind, worth changes. Right? Worth changes. What things are worth. And so, where does the community gather to make these decisions? How does a community make up its mind about what things are worth? The original, the etymology, the, the meaning of the word worship comes from the word worth. Worth-ship. To gather in the name of, of Jesus is to gather because we believe Jesus to be worthy, but it's also a gathering to discuss and determine and discern what things are worth. That's what we're doing here right now. That's what we're, and what we decide things are worth changes everything about our lives. Is it worth more to work longer and have more money? Or is it worth more to retire early and spend time with kids? 
right? your kids and grandkids, which is worth more? Is it worth more to uh, seek a career that is utterly satisfying, or is it worth more that, that serves others, or is it worth more to, to pursue a career that uh, brings more glory to yourself? Right? Is it worth more? Uh, I mean, we focus on worth, and, and when we make all these decisions, it changes our careers, it changes what we do, it changes what, how we teach our children, and... Uh, in a somewhat morbid example, I've sat down with many families as they've filled out their uh, obituary for loved ones. And you know how there's always two sentences at the end. It's all the family, and then at the end there's always these two sentences. This person did A, B, and C, right? And those are the two or three things that if you wanted to figure out a person, what did that person value? Was, what, was, what did that person think was worth their time? That's where it shows up. This person uh, loved their church, loved their family, and did a lot with flowers. I mean, that was what was worth their time. So these decisions about what is worthy matter. What we listen to today in the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus talking about worth. Right? What is worthy? What is, what, where do we have our, our treasures? What is worth the most to us? Treasures are, are, are going to either be, according to what Jesus lays out, the things of the world. Money, power, uh, uh, sort of money, power, prestige, clothes, gadgets, our homes, I mean, these things of the world, or our, our, val our worth, our treasure, can be in those things of eternal value, those which uh, come from following the footsteps of Jesus, things like honesty and humility, the love of, love of neighbor, and the making of peace. And, and these two ways of approaching life, of deciding what is worthy, are in, in contradiction to each other, aren't they? Right? If you, want to va if you value power above all else, you're not going to be very humble. If you value stuff, your things, it's going to be real hard to love your neighbor because your neighbor's need is, not, you're going to be a hard time to meet your neighbor's need if you value your stuff more than the love of neighbor. To say that prestige and honor is of the greatest worth to be well thought of in life, it, that makes it hard to be able to be a maker of peace because to make peace you have to be willing to confess when you've gone astray. Right? To be a peacemaker involves confession and repentance for all involved. And uh, you can't do that if it's worth the most to uh, look good. And so Jesus lays out that you can pick one, but not both. You can't, have it, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Jesus lays out some examples of this. He talks about how the eye is the lamp of the body. I always found this confusing until I started reading it in this context where we're talking about worth. You can pick one, you can pick the other. You can look at one thing, you can look at the other thing, but you ever try to look at two things at once? It doesn't work. You go cross-eyed. It, it just doesn't work. In the same way, you can follow one master, you can follow the other, but you can't follow both. It's not that Jesus says you won't or you shouldn't, but you can't. You come to a turn in the road, a T in the road, you go left, you go right, but you can't do both. You have to choose what is worth the most to you. And one thing is going to be worth the most. You can't have a tie when it comes to what is most worthy. And so it says we cannot serve two masters, mammon and in Christ. And the translation, it says wealth. And wealth is, I don't like that translation because the term is mammon. And mammon is not just money. It's not just stuff. It's stuff, it, it, mammon that is sort of personified, the love of stuff, the love of the, the ways of the world. And it said, and when you're talking about mammon and loyalty and worth, um, it's about loyalty, not about whether you actually have it. You can have all the stuff in the world, but if Jesus is worth more than that, you're doing fine. right? You can have none of the stuff in the world. You can be flat broke, but if, uh, if you're flat broke and you, you, your loyalty is to stuff and the gathering of stuff, even if you can't hold on to it, that, that's still a problem. This is not about what, what you have. It's about what is your loyalty, what is your worth, what, what do you desire above all else. And so Jesus lays out this decision. Choose what's worth the most to you. Choose what is worth the most to you, to your lives, to your hopes. Choose either the stuff of the world, prestige, power, and control, or choose Christ, humility, uh, love of neighbor, seeking of peace. Now, the Sunday school response to this is, well, obviously you pick that Jesus is worth the most, but let's be honest, one seems like it has a better retirement plan, doesn't it? Right? One has a, a better a sense of security to it. 
And Jesus has something to say about this. He, he points to the birds of the air and the lilies of the field, and he says, relax. Just relax. Do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil nor do they spin, yet I say to you there that not even Solomon in all of his glory clothed himself like one of these." Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. The lilies don't worry. The birds don't either. They're not worried because they're doing what they're meant to do. Right? The birds of, in the air do fine. The lilies of the field need not worry. As long as the lily is in the field and the bird is in the air, they're doing exactly what God is meant for them to do. The problem gets to be when you have the lily of the cement. You ever see those like uh, those pictures? I put one in the front of the bolts, and the pictures of like flowers growing up through cement or blacktop. It, people see that and think it's like a nature will find a way. Isn't it nice that something? No, that, I don't. I look at that and I get depressed for the flower. Because what's going to happen to that flower? Going to die, ain't it? Uh, that's not going to make it. The lily of the field does just fine as long as it's in the field, doing what it is designed and meant to do. If the lily is of the cement, it's kind of doomed. Right? When, God, when that which God created does that which God meant for it to do, it does really well. But if a bird, des bird decides that it wants to marry a fish and go live on a coral reef, how long is that going to last? 30 seconds. It, it just doesn't go well. And so if God provides for the lily in the field and the bird in the air, this is like those old English tests. If lily is to field and bird is to air, then human is to... It's in the passage. Seek the kingdom of God. Right? That is, if lilies are provided for by being in the field and birds are provided for when they are in the air, we are provided for by being in the kingdom of God, seeking the kingdom of God. As we talked about last week, whenever you see that term, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, think about this. It's here in your head, this idea of the politics of God, the way that God wants us to live together. And, and what we see as an example of this is when they live together in the book of Acts. Uh, after Pentecost, people are joining the church. They are gathering to worship, agreeing to what is worthy, having their sense of worth changed by following Jesus. And, and what we read is that they were all of one heart, full of grace, for no one was in need. What an amazing statement, right? They were full of grace, all of one heart, for no one was in need. To be able to say that, that's impressive. And the, one of the examples of how this happened, we read of Barnabas selling a field and giving the proceeds to the church. Why would you do that? You would do it because, because you have worshipped together. It is worth more to you that your neighbor... In the pew, or they are probably in chairs. Your neighbor, your fellow brother and sister in Christ, it's worth more to you that they have what they need than it is for you to continue to own the field. It is worth more for you that everyone have what they need than, the, than that you get ahead. That is what, it, when we're talking about worth, that, that's where the rubber hits the road. It is worth more for everyone in the church to have what they need than for one person to get ahead. And it, this is not saying that anyone had more stuff. Most of the early followers of Jesus were dirt poor. Uh, Blue-collar laborers working for their daily bread, and that's what they would get, their daily bread. And so it's not that any one person, Barnabas is the exception. For the most part, it is not that they got together and all of a sudden they had more stuff. It's they got together and it was worth the most to them that everyone get along. And so they started doing things like they had the first deacons who's, who went around and made sure everyone had something to eat. When birds fly in the air they do just fine. When lilies grow in the field they're going to they're gonna be beautiful. When we as followers of Jesus as people made in the image of God when we get together and do church that's what, that is how God provides for us. This is the kingdom of God experienced when we gather to worship, agreeing what is worthy, what we value. That's how God provides for us. Seek the kingdom of God, and all the rest will be provided unto you.
Now, I do need to be clear about what this is saying and what it's not saying. This is not saying that Barnabas sold his field and walked down the street and started throwing money out to whoever he met. This is not socialism. This is not everyone in the entire society into a contract, right? This is not socialism. It, what this is, is Jesus giving the, social, the Sermon on the Mount for his disciples for how they should live together, right? How we should live together. They, so the people gathered together and they took care of their fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. As we said, you, you pray, pray the Lord's Prayer and now you're all brothers and sisters, here we are, and we take care of each other because it's worth more to us that we all get along than that any one of us gets ahead. We are God's way of providing for each other. We are the answer to each other's prayers. We are God's design for how to provide and love for our neighbor. Our ultimate answer to people in need in the world, I mean, we, we'll, we do some help, we give some people some assistance, I get calls on a regular basis, but in the end, our greatest response to people in need is, come do church. Follow Jesus together, be part of the brothers and sisters in Christ, and, and come and be f shaped and formed by our worship. And you will seek first the kingdom and all the rest will be added unto you. Our ultimate response to need is not any handouts, it's Jesus. Come follow Jesus together. We come together to worship, to agree what is worthy, to argue about it, and then hopefully come to agreement, to agree what has value, and we confess that following Jesus is the most valuable thing in our life. And in doing so, in seeking the kingdom of God with others, that is how we are provided for. Just as the lily needs the field, the bird needs the air, we need this. For this is how God provides. Thanks be to God. Amen. We come to a time when we confess when uh, this has not been the case, so let's pray together. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. My friends, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. This proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Now as a forgiving and peacemaking people, I invite you to stand and offer each other signs of that peace.